This is a mechanism of disease map for seizures and epilepsy. I'll be talking about the etiology, the pathophysiology, and the manifestations of seizures and epilepsy. As in all of these flowcharts, each of the boxes is color-coded according to this legend that you see at the top right here. And I'll be clearing each of these boxes and talking through them one by one as we repopulate the entire flowchart. Let's get started. We'll start with the central pathophysiology of seizures and epilepsy, which is really just the definition between the two, and it's important to be able to differentiate between these terms. A seizure is an excessive or hypersynchronous episode of transient electrical brain activity. In contrast, epilepsy is a chronic neurologic disorder characterized by a predisposition to seizures. So the individual episode is called a seizure, and when the brain is chronically predisposed to having that episode, to having seizures, we call that epilepsy. Now the etiologies between seizure and epilepsy have some things in common, and there are some things that are different. So we'll have some things pointing to both seizures and epilepsy, and some things pointing to them individually. Let's start with some seizure triggers, both for patients with and without epilepsy. So this kind of applies to both boxes up here. One seizure trigger is excessive physical exertion. This is largely because physical exertion can deplete your electrolytes and can change your flow physiology as you become dehydrated. Fever can precipitate a seizure. This is especially common in children where they're called febrile seizures. Sleep deprivation can precipitate a seizure. Music has been so shown to trigger seizures, and this is thought to be through the emotional response caused by music rather than from the tone itself. Although there have been stud studies where a specific musical tone or a specific note can also precipitate a seizure. Similar to auditory stimulation, visual stimulation can also cause a seizure. Flashing lights, such as from strobe lights or video games, can trigger a seizure. Alcohol consumption can trigger a seizure. This is because alcohol is a central nervous system depressant. So if you all of a sudden have a change in your central nervous system um, res like response, then you can trigger a seizure that way. Medication issues, such as adherence to um, anti-epileptic medications or new changes or new interactions between new drugs can also trigger seizures. Hormones have been shown to trigger seizures as well. This is most common in the menstrual cycle for women of reproductive age or postmenopausal when you have a significant decline in some hormones after 51 years old in women. So these are triggers that can um, cause seizures both in patients with and without epilepsy. This next group are causes of acute symptomatic seizures. So these typically cause seizures in patients that might have never had a seizure before. Traumatic brain injury, of course the cell and tissue damage associated with that can cause excessive electrical brain activity. Intracranial surgery, similarly, can be very damaging to parts of the brain and cause excessive electrical brain activity, causing a seizure. Strokes, cerebrovascular accidents, those can also cause seizures. As you have ischemia or a reperfusion perfusion injury following ischemia, you can trigger a seizure. Encephalitis and meningitis, these infectious processes, can cause inflammation in the brain, which can change the brain's excitability level, causing a seizure. There are some electrolyte disturbances, including hypocalcemia, hypoglycemia, and uremia, that can cause a seizure as well. Autoimmune flares of some autoimmune diseases, like systemic lupus erythematosus, given in the example here, can also manifest as seizures. Some medications have seizures as a side effect, so that could be a prescription medication. It could also be recreational drugs, and alcohol withdrawal can also cause individual seizures. Again, alcohol is a central nervous system depressant, so if you are dependent on alcohol and your central nervous system is chronically depressed, when you stop the alcohol, your brain is returning to that normal level of excitability, and that return to normal might not be as smooth as you want it to be, and it can precipitate seizures. Next, let's talk about some more chronic causes of seizures, and these tend to cause epilepsy because epilepsy is a chronic state of hyperexcitability that predisposes you to seizures. First, we have some structural factors, tuberculosis and, sorry, excuse me, tuberous sclerosis and hippocampal sclerosis can cause epilepsy. Congenital cerebral or arteriovenous malformations, these are vascular problems in the brain that can cause epilepsy. 
brain tumors and brain metastases, of course, are going to have a structural impact. So they're going to have a mass effect on the brain, and that can precipitate seizures in epilepsy. Brain cancer and metastases, similarly, uh, might result in a patient getting cranial radiation therapy, which can cause sclerosis in the brain and predispose you to having epilepsy. Again, autoimmune problems, including autoimmune encephalitides, specifically anti-NMDA receptor encephalitis, can predispose you to epilepsy. You'll see a lot of things kind of repeating between these lists. We saw alcohol here and here. We're seeing autoimmune things here and here. Um, so a, a lot of these are kind of the same, but it's important to consider them both in the acute context where they cause an individual isolated seizure, as well as in the chronic context where there's a problem in the brain's structure now that's causing you to have chronic seizures. Anyway, let's go on. You can have microcephaly, uh, megalocephaly, and cortical just dysgenesis. These are hereditary structural problems where the brain is not formed properly, and that can predispose you to seizures. Perinatal injury, specifically uh, hypoxic ischemic injuries where the brain might not have gotten enough oxygen um, during um, prenatal or natal periods can cause epilepsy as well. Traumatic brain injuries again. Um, here we've noted that when the seizures start over one week after the injury itself, the traumatic brain injury itself, that would be considered epilepsy compared to if it was a seizure occurring right after the traumatic brain injury or right after the surgery, that's just considered an asymptomatic, or excuse me, a symptomatic isolated seizure. There are some mitochondrial diseases like MILAS that can cause epilepsy. Neurodegenerative diseases, this is typically in older adults that um, have dementia, aged 60 years old or older, can have epilepsy as well. Some chromosomal abnormalities like Angelman syndrome, Prader-Willi syndrome, and Rett syndrome might manifest with epilepsy. Again, the infectious causes, these can be acute infections like we saw before, meningitis or encephalitis. Again, these seizures, this threshold of one week after the acute infection would apply here as well for it to be considered epilepsy. Otherwise, it'll be seizure as shown in this box up here. Chronic central nervous system infections can also have complications where they lead the patient to have epilepsy. This could be scarring or otherwise damage to the brain tissue following toxoplasmosis, malaria, and neurocystocercosis. You can have all kinds of hereditary or genetic disorders. Some of them are listed here. You can have mutations in proteins like ion channels or uh, neurotransmitter receptors, specifically the, the KCNQ2 and the SCN1A genes have been shown to cause epilepsy. Some inborn errors of metabolism like organic acidemias and fetal ketonuria can predispose to epilepsy. And lastly, there are some metabolic disorders like PKU, glycosylation disorders, lysosomal storage diseases, and peroxisomal biogenesis disorders. All of those can also predispose you to epilepsy. So lots of causes, and they kind of span all of these core concepts from structural to medicine to drugs, biochemical, electrolyte abnormalities, genetic things, flow physiology, infectious things, inflammatory things, everything is represented and a lot of different things can cause seizures. Now that we've established that, let's get into the manifestations of seizures and epilepsy. We can break down the manifestations into things happening in the ictal state and things happening in the post-ictal state. So this is happening during the seizure, this is happening following the seizure. Let's break down seizures and epilepsy into two big groups. The first group is when the errant episode of high brain activity involves at least one entire hemisphere of the brain. These are called generalized onset seizures. And we'll see a common theme with these generalized onset seizures that involve at least one entire hemisphere is that the patient has amnesia of the event. They don't remember the event. They lose consciousness during it, and afterwards they don't remember having the seizure. So the first of these, and the most famous of these, is the tonic-clonic seizure, also called the grand mal seizure. And these have a, a series of symptoms. You might recognize these from movies or TV shows where somebody falls and starts shaking. That's usually representing a grand mal seizure. It sometimes starts with a prodrome. The patient has a sleep or mood change. They might have lightheadedness, anxiety, irritability, or poor concentration. When the seizure starts, as we mentioned, the patient loses consciousness, and this happens very suddenly and without warning. They might have had the prodrome for minutes to hours before, but when the actual seizure starts, they don't know. It's usually pretty sudden 
The most prominent symptom, the most noticeable symptom is usually motor. They go from a tonic state to a clonic state. During the tonic state, they have rotated eyes, apnea, and bilateral, excuse me, lateral lung bi tongue biting. That usually ends up with lacerations in their tongue, and that's usually a sign that somebody has had a seizure if you open their mouth and see that their tongue is all chewed up and bleeding. That tonic stage then progresses into a clonic stage where they have rhythmic muscle twitching. And that's usually what you see in the movies when somebody's on the ground shaking like that. Patient might also have bowel or bladder incontinence during the seizure as well. In the postictal state, patient will be unresponsive, they'll be confused, they might not be talking, they could have aphasia, they'll be tired, of course. It's very exhausting to move all your muscles like that and all that excess brain activity is exhausting as well. Muscular flaccidity, they uh, won't have as much muscle tone as they did before the seizure. Their muscles can be in pain after all that movement. They can have headache and hypersalivation. Um, hypersalivation is important because you do want to protect their airways. They might be salivating so much that they end up aspirating some of that saliva. And as we mentioned, for all of these generalized onset seizures, there's gonna be amnesia of the event. They lost consciousness and they're not gonna remember what happened. They'll be very confused. Other types of generalized seizures include the atonic seizure. This is also known as a drop attack. It also happens very suddenly, but in this case you don't have the tonic or the clonic movement. The patient usually just falls to the ground, has head drop, and collapses, and it usually doesn't last as long. It usually lasts less than 15 seconds. This one again has amnesia of the event, and usually the post-ictal presentation is not as severe as the tonic-clonic grand mal seizure. Next, another generalized onset seizure is the non-motor seizure. This is also called absence seizure, and it's more prevalent in children than adults. Kids will have a sudden blank stare, and they'll suddenly be unresponsive, and this can occur very frequently, up to hundreds of times per day, and it usually lasts less than 10 seconds. They sometimes also have these automatisms, like lip smacking, eye fluttering, or head nodding during the absence seizures as well. And usually teachers just mischaracterize this as the, as the kid not paying attention. The kid's just daydreaming. He's not listening to the lecture. He's not paying attention in class. Um, but in fact, it could be a non-motor seizure, an absence seizure. Again, non-motor seizures present with amnesia of the event. Now, the next big category for seizure manifestations are caused by focal structural problems. Remember that this one involved at least one entire hemisphere. The focal problems are smaller parts of the brain than that. And the presentation really depends on which parts of the brain are affected. So we'll kind of break that down and we'll see there's gonna be many manifestations here um, covering all of the many parts of the brain. These are sometimes called focal seizures and they were previously called partial seizures. So you might see them called focal seizures or partial seizures. They can also have a prodrome, not necessary, but the patient can have anxiety, fear, and deja vu. This can last seconds to minutes leading up to the seizures. They can have motor symptoms. They don't always, but they can. They can have automatisms similar to the absence seizures, like lip smacking, blinking, tapping. They can be atonic, like the atonic seizures, where the patient suddenly does not have tone and is unable to move a certain part of their body or a certain half of their body. They can have myoclonus or twitching. They can have chronic repetitive movements like pedaling or jumping. And they can also have a series of convulsions that kind of marches from one part of the body to the other. That's called a Jacksonian march. They can also have autonomic symptoms like flushing or sweating that happen very suddenly. They can have cognitive problems as well like dyslexia, aphasia, anomia, and amnesia. They can have emotional problems, sometimes manifested as emotional outbursts of laughing, crying, or intense fear. They can also have sensory problems, like visual hallucinations. They can have paresthesias, which are kind of just um, touch hallucinations. They can have vertigo, where the room is spinning. They can have auditory problems. They can hear like auditory sounds, like ringing in the ears all of a sudden. They can have olfactory hallucinations. They can smell unusual things or smell things very intensely, much more intensely than usual. And they can have gustatory hallucinations where same thing, they taste something unusual or they taste something intensely all of a sudden. If the focal structural problem affects the temporal lobe specifically, the focal seizure can also impair consciousness can also impair the patient's awareness. So um, this makes sense. If the, if the seizure affects the entire hemisphere, it's going to affect the temporal lobe. 
and the patient will always have amnesia of the event. The focal structural problem usually doesn't impair awareness, but if it's affecting the temporal lobe, it can, and the patient might not remember. They might have amnesia of the event. Finally, some last words on the postictal state following a focal seizure. They can have a residual transient deficit. For instance, if they had an atonic uh, episode of the right arm, they might not be able to use that right arm quite as well for a little bit of time following the seizure. Because of this, because there's a residual return to normal, this postictal state is sometimes mistaken for a stroke, a CVA, or a transient ischemic attack. And it's important to differentiate between a partial seizure, a focal seizure, and a, um, a stroke or a mini stroke. Lastly, there's this Todd paralysis, where you have weakness or paralysis of muscles of the face, which can lead to a droopy face following a focal seizure. There's a few things that we think cause this. One is focal hypoperfusion. Once you have that intense brain activity um, in that certain part of your brain, you might not be getting as, blood, as much blood to it as you need following the seizure. There's also a prolonged refractory period after the cell has depolarized, and there's prolonged local inhibition following a focal seizure. So all of those can contribute to Todd paralysis or weakness of the involved facial muscles leading to a facial droop following a focal seizure. This has been a flowchart on seizures and epilepsy. I hope this was helpful in differentiating between seizures and epilepsy, the many etiologies that can span really everything in our pathophysiology book, as well as the differences between generalized seizures as well as focal seizures. Thank you for listening.